And the booty, the bounty, the war money of a hundred camels have been placed on Abu Bakr and the Prophet dead or alive. And Suraqa ibn Malik says that he was sitting with his fellow tribesmen and the news comes that they're searching for three riders. And one of my people came back from a hunting expedition and he says, I saw three people in the distance. I'm sure this must be the three the Quraysh are looking for. Suraqa got greedy. So immediately he lied and he says, oh no, no, that's not those three. That's the party of so-and-so. They told me they're going on an expedition in that region. The man who thought it was, it came up excited, he sat down, conversation continued. Suraqa says when they forgot about the incident, he slipped away, rushed back home, got his war horse ready, put on his armor and galloped at lightning speed as fast as he could to get to those three people. And Suraqa says, when I saw them in the distance, I saw that one of the two, i.e. Abu Bakr, was riding in a very agitated state, always looking right and left, sometimes behind, sometimes going to the front, sometimes going back behind, sometimes going to the front. Because he's so worried about the Prophet Sallallahu that he's worried he's gonna be attacked from the back, he goes in the back. Then his paranoia gets the better of him. What if he's attacked from the front? He goes to the front. Whereas the other rider was riding calmly and peacefully, not turning once left or right, reciting something, reciting the Quran, reciting something. All of a sudden, my horse sunk into the ground and threw me, flipped me over. And it had never done this before. In another version, he said that I could see a smoke between me and the three riders. Something's clearly wrong. And so he said, I pulled out my Aslam. Aslam is their method of predicting the future. So he has those things with him. So he said, I threw out my Aslam onto the sand to see which direction is going to go. And the response that I got was, do not proceed. I ignored it and continued going. The second time I came closer, once again, the exact same thing happened. Once again, I was thrown across the horse. Once again, I took it out. Once again, it says, do not proceed. I ignored it and went for the third time until finally they were within yelling distance. I could speak to them. And for the third time, my horse horse did it even more violently and I knew that this was a force beyond me, beyond my power. And I knew that the affair of this man would spread, I Islam would spread. So I called out to them that I am a safe person, I'm not going to harm you, give me permission to come close. From the one who's hunting, he becomes the one asking permission. So when he finally got permission to come forth, Suraqa ibn Malik says that I asked permission from the Prophet wasallam to give me protection in writing. And the Prophet allowed Abdullah ibn Arqat to write down on a scroll, write down on a parchment, a man for Suraqa ibn Malik, that you will be safe. You protected us today, we're going to protect you tomorrow whenever the need comes. Suraqa said, I offered them some food and the both of them refused. They had no need of it. But Abu Bakr said, don't tell anybody about us. And so Suraqa didn't tell anybody about them until finally, when they did arrive in Medina, by the way, Suraqa told them all the story that happened and Abu Jahl wrote him a scathing poem where he called Suraqa the foolish that they slipped out of your hands. And Suraqa wrote back poetry, that's all in Ibn Ishaq. And he said to him that, had you been there on that day, and you had seen what I had seen, then you wouldn't be saying what you're saying. Ibn Abdul Bar, another very early author says that when Suraqa turned to leave, the Prophet ﷺ for the first time turned to him and said to him, Oh Suraqa, how will you be the day that you put on the bracelets of Kisra? Suraqa, shocked, couldn't say anything other than Kisra, the son of Hurmuz, meaning the emperor of Persia. And that's it, the Prophet didn't even respond. And on the day of Hunayn, the Prophet ﷺ conquered basically the other tribes of lying Mecca, and he finally conquered the tribe of Suraqa ibn Malik. He pulled out the very piece of leather that he had, that the Prophet ﷺ had written to him, and the Prophet ﷺ recognized Suraqa, and he gave him the security, he gave him the aman, and Suraqa accepted Islam, and he migrated to Medina, he lived in Medina. The Prophet ﷺ passed away within six, seven years of his death, the mighty nation of the Sassanid Persians collapsed. And as is typical, all of the jewelry, all of the treasures of the palace are gathered and sent to Umar ibn al-Khattab. And the masjid of the Prophet is full of treasures and gold. He says, where is Suraqa? Call Suraqa for me. And so Suraqa is called and Umar puts him on his own chair. And Umar finds in that gold, the bracelets of Kisra, because everybody knows the promise. He finds the two bracelets of Kisra. He puts them on the hand of Suraqa ibn Malik and the entire congregation starts saying Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. This is the fulfillment of what the Prophet said. And in fact, the version Ibn Abdul Bar says they took Suraqa around Medina 
Umar ibn Khattab said, Alhamdulillah, who has taken this bracelets away from Kisra, the son of Hurmuz, and given them to Suraqa, a Bedouin from the tribe of the Bani, the tribe of the Banu Mudlij. Alhamdulillah, who has taken them from this mighty man and given them to this Muslim as what the Prophet predicted so many years ago. The story of the Hijrah has a number of small stories, and one of the significant ones is the story of Umm Ma'bad. And this was, by the way, outside of Medina by an hour and a half drive in our time. It's still in our time, this place is still called the same as it was called then, and it's called Qadid. And that's where this incident took place. Umm Ma'bad narrates the story herself, and she says that she is an elderly lady, and she is a complete like Bedouin. She is living in the desert in a tent, wandering from place to place, finding food and water. So her husband had left to find some food, and she's in her sheepskin or goat tent. And she hears the rustling outside of some travelers who ask permission to come in. She asks them to come in, and it turns out it's Abu Bakr and the Prophet ﷺ, but she doesn't recognize them, because she doesn't know who they are. So the Prophet ﷺ entered in, and Abu Bakr, and they said, may we purchase any food from you? And Umm Ma'bad replied that she apologized, she has absolutely nothing to give them. So the Prophet ﷺ saw in the tent an old goat in the corner. So the Prophet ﷺ asked permission to milk the goat. Umm Ma'bad smirked and said, that day has long gone. The goat is beyond giving milk. And so the Prophet ﷺ once again said, but do you allow me to? And so Umm Ba'bah said, if you want to, go ahead. I mean, if that's what you want to do. And the Prophet ﷺ made dua and he mentioned the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he moved his hand under the udder and the udder filled up with milk right then and there. And Abu Bakr then milked the milk from this goat and it brimmed all the way to the top and the Prophet ﷺ drank, Abu Bakr drank and they left the remainder for Umm Ma'bad and her husband. When her husband returned, he shocked to find the milk. Where'd you get this milk from? From this goat. How did this goat give milk? So she gave the whole story. She described the Prophet ﷺ in detail. One of them, you know, was taller and handsome and this and that and the other looked like his companion. Her husband said, those are the two the Quraysh are searching for. Do you not know that one of them claims to be a Nabi? And when she heard this, she realized this is not just a claim, he is a Nabi. And so both her and her husband accepted Islam. SubhanAllah, when he is basically running for his life, we have references of at least four or five people converting in this journey from Makkah to Medina. It is also narrated once that a caravan passed them by. They recognized Abu Bakr and they find out some information, whatever they wanted to, and then they asked Abu Bakr, who is this man with you? And so Abu Bakr said, he is my guide, guiding me to the path. And of course, what Abu Bakr meant was, he is my guide to Surat al-Mustaqim, guiding me to the path to Jannah, right? But what they understood was, this is my hired guide that is guiding me. This also shows us, by the way, that at a certain point in time, the guide, Abdullah bin Urayqit, left them. So the guide basically brought them to a place where from that point onwards, they knew how to get to Medina. So right now, we're basically right outside the city of Medina, and the process is about to come in.